Hello fellow scratchers! Collision points. Just what are they? Well, we are back for another captivating episode of our epic RPG series, and at last we are going to work on adding collision detection for our players. And about time I hear you say, but I have been putting this off for a good reason. For simple tile sets, we can assume each tile is either solid or not, and that makes collision detection real easy. But not so for our more complex tile set. For example, some tiles are half a block wide. And that collision looks awful. But worse than this, we even have some pixel wide dividing walls. Oh man, we need a more elegant solution. Now, if you want to know more about my thought process, then go back and watch my RPG devlog episode 2. But essentially, I decided upon a cunning collision system using nine collider pins. We define which pins are solid for each tile costume, and since the player is wider than the distance between pins, we cannot pass between them. But they can walk right up close to either side. Just perfect for our game. To store this collision metadata, we label solid pins as 1 and non-solid as 0. Before working from left to right and then bottom to top, combining them into a 9 digit value. This is our collision pin value, and they can be easily stored in a new tile pin list. One row per tile costume, enabling fast lookup for each tile as we look for collisions. The next question is, do we want to enter all these collision values by hand? Well of course not, there's over 500 tile costumes in our game, man! So stay tuned, because we are going to be coding up yet another super awesome enhancement to our level editor to let us speedily draw our collision pins directly in our game. This is just too cool. So what are we waiting for? Let's get scratching! We begin from where we left off in episode 6, making sure to save the project as a new copy, for well, this is episode 7. Now let's start by making a new list to hold the tile collision pin values. We'll name it Tile Pins, making it for all sprites as all sprites will need to check for collisions. So in theory, if we were doing this all by hand, we could identify the first tile costume number in our costume editor, that's costume number 20, and then in our new list add rows down to the corresponding item 20. We enter the collision string 100100111. And that would be that. Not so hard, huh? But times that by 500 costumes and it would take us a very long time, and would be even harder to track down our mistakes. Yep, we're bound to make them. So let's hide that list for the time being, and we'll focus on making the collision pin editor. Ok, make sure you are in the tiles sprite now. And we want a way to toggle the collision pin editor on and off. So make a new variable, naming it palette meta editor, for this sprite only. Hold on, what does meta mean? Well, metadata is any data, that is information, that describes something about another bit of data. And this list will contain collision data describing our tile costumes. So set palette meta editor to zero, right when the green flag is clicked. Then to toggle it on and off. When key pressed, and we'll use the P key for palette. Do you think we'll remember all these key codes though? Now we'll toggle the value by setting palette meta to 1, subtract the palette meta editor. Cool, feel free to press that P key right now and just confirm it is toggling on and off between 1 and 0. Yes, super, good job little variable. Next up we'll want to paint the collision pins themselves, overlaying them upon our existing tiles in the palette. For this we can find the define paint palette. Now if we just scroll down until we find the second stamp, which is after we switch to costume GIDX here. And remember GIDX is both the grid position in the palette and the costume number, since they are laid out one after the other sequentially. So after stamping the tile costume, we want to draw the pin on top. Let's make a new custom block for this, naming it Draw Collision Pins. And we're going to have two inputs, 
X and Y. Tick to run without screen refresh, and then click OK. But we only want to draw these pins when the meta editor is enabled with that P key. If palette meta editor is greater than zero, then and drop in the new draw collision pin block. The X and Y we can just borrow from the current X position and Y position of this sprite. I'll explain why we need these later. Cool, we just drop that right in after we stamp the tile costume in the palette. And now to draw some pins, how exciting! We'll start simple, a single central pin for each tile, and we'll use the pen to do it. Set the pen size to 5 pixels, and set pen colour to pure white. OK? Then to paint a perfect circle, simply use the pen down and the pen up, just like jabbing the paper with a felt tip pen. In theory, that should do the trick. So smash that green flag, and then with the level editor open, tap the P key to enable the palette meta editor. And there we go, a perfect white dot should have appeared at the centre of each tile in the palette. A brilliant start, and they are easily toggled on and off with the same P key. With that success, we can try to expand this to draw a small grid of 3x3 three three pins per costume, that's 9 pins each. We've created plenty of grid based loops by now, so this should feel very familiar. So separate off the set colour and pen down and up scripts first. We'll need them soon enough. We want to begin drawing the first of our nine pins offset below and to the left, changing x by negative 11, which is a good value, and change y also by negative 11. That's just around a third of a tile width. Now we loop, repeating for three rows of pins, and again for three pins in each row, or columns if you will. Then in our loop we do the drawing so drop those scripts back in there. We just need to ensure after drawing each pin that we move on to the next pin position. Change x by positive 11 pixels. Then once a full row is complete, we need to move up a row. But not before we reset back to the first column again. To do this, we change x by, and this is going to be negative 11 multiplied by 3 because we've done it three times, and that will be negative 33, right? Then we can change y by our 11 to move up to the next pin above. Sweet! Are we done? Not quite, because after moving the sprite in this script, we must ensure to return it to where it was before this script ran, otherwise the sprite palette will not continue to paint correctly. So go to xy, and luckily we had the forethought to pass the starting position of the sprite in as inputs x and y when we created the custom block. How thoughtful. Drop the x and y into the go to xy block at the bottom of this script. Splendid, because now we get to test. Smash that green flag and press P. And wow, look at all those funky white dots. These will be perfect for visualising our collision pins, don't you think? and we can still scroll around the palette to get access to all the other tiles. Cool! Let's move on. Next we define a collision pin string, making a new variable naming it pin string, for this sprite only. And let's push some random pins into this. Set pin string to 10101010101. That should be 9 pin digits in total. Do this before we start moving the sprite into position up here. Now, as we loop around in these repeat loops, we need to keep track of which digit or letter of the pin string we have reached. So another new variable, and name this one i for integer. We'll begin by setting i to 1 for the first letter of the pin string. And we move on to the next letter using the change i by 1. Before we loop around again down here. Perfect! That will loop from 1 up to 9 as we progress through all the pins. This script is getting a bit long though, so I'm going to pull out the pin painting from the repeat loops. Make a new custom block naming it draw pin of type with the input type. 
and run without screen refresh. This will replace these pen scripts, but make sure to leave the change x and the change i variable in the repeat loop. Next, place a call to draw pin type back in the loop before the change x, like so. But now we need the individual pin values from the pin string. That would be a 0 or a 1. How do we get a single letter from a variable? Well, using the letter of block, of course. The letter we want is given by our new i variable, 1 through 9, and it's coming from the pin string variable. Yeah, I'm liking that. So each of the 1s and zeros will now be passed one at a time through to our pin drawing script over on the right. We just need to distinguish which type it is, a 1 or 0, and change the colour appropriately. If else. Putting the pen down and up blocks underneath. The set pen colour then goes inside the if. OK, so our condition is whether the pin type is firstly a 1, a solid pin, and I'm opting for a nice sky blue to represent a solid pin. The else is for non-solid pins, just a placeholder really, but it's important we can still see it. So set the colour to white. So how is this coming along? Hey, take a look at this, it's working great! Our simple pin pattern 10101010101 has made a lattice of blue and white circles. But I feel that the white circles are too solid looking. We need to ghost them out. Drop a set pen transparency to and whap it right up to 90%. OK, yes, that's more like it. It's obvious now which pins are on and which pins are off, solid and not solid. We can have some fun with this now testing out different pin combinations by changing the ones and zeros in our pin string variable. Yeah, that's really fun. I love playing around with that. But our goal is to feed these pins from the tile pin list we created right back at the start of the episode. No problem. Replace that fixed string with an item of list block. Switching it to the tile pin list and the item number of this tile costume, if you remember, that is stored in the grid index, GIDX variable, right? Starting at 20 and counting up for each costume in our tile palette. So this is interesting. Bring back up the tile pin list. See where we ended a pin string for costume 20? So if we run the project and press P, would you look at that? There is our manually entered collision pin string represented as coloured pins. That is really funky. Shall we try adding a new one for costume 22? It only registers when you click out of the list. There you go. This is so meta. Awesome work. As you can imagine, now that we can visualise our pin layouts, we could just go through each costume and enter the pin strings by hand, matching them to the costume collision boundaries. But there are still a whole lot of them to go through, so instead we'll make it possible to toggle these pins right here in the editor too. Before we continue though, let's clear down the entire tile pin list using a delete all of tile pins. Careful not to accidentally delete your grid list, otherwise goodbye level. Ugh. If you ever did do that, you'll just need to pop into the level store sprite and run the new level script by hand to start up a new fresh level. Brilliant. Find the draw pin of type block. And as we draw each pin, we can now check whether the user is trying to toggle it on or off with a key press. If how close is the mouse to this pin? Distance to mouse pointer. If it's less than 5.5, that's half the distance between pins, 11 divided by 2, then we know our mouse is over this pin. So, if else, and check for a key press. The number 1. 1 for a solid pin, right? Now actually, setting pins is not super straightforward. So let's make a new custom block, set pin, with an input of pin hash, pin number, that'll be the pin number from 1 to 9, followed by the label of tile, with the input tile hash, that'll be the costume number of our tile, followed by the label 
two, and a final input of value, which will be either a one or zero for the time being. Wow, that was a long one. Hit run without screen refresh, and we can script this baby up. First though, let's put it in place. The pin number is given by the variable i. The tile costume is grid index GIDX. And the value we are setting the pin to, well, this is the one key, right? So set it to one. Great, so what if we want to set it back to zero? Sadly, we can't use a zero key as that turns the level editor on and off. Instead, then we'll use the X key, like a delete or remove key. And we set the pin to zero. And this is where things get interesting. Firstly, we are asking to change the pin layout for the tile costume tile hash. Now, assume tile hash is tile number 20. What if our list doesn't have 20 items in it yet? We can't update a row that doesn't exist, so we need to fill the list with rows first. To do this, we repeat, and we use a subtract, starting at the number of items that we require, that's given by the input variable tile hash, and in our example that's 20, so we subtract from that the number of items already in the pin list. Right now that's zero, so this would loop 20 minus zero, that's a full 20 times. Great, so add to the tile pins list 20 times. But careful now, the value we add should be a string of nine zeros. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine zeros. Careful to get the right amount, exactly nine. Okay, shall we give that a test to confirm? Use a new set pin block, setting pin one of tile 20 to the value one. The tile pin list starts empty, and after we click the test set pin block, voila, we now have that required 20th item ready to update its pins. Let's pull out item 20 and take a look. Set pen string to item of the list tile pins. And we want the item given by tile hash, that's item 20. Run that test again, clicking the set pin of tile 20 again, and now the pin string variable should be reporting all zeros. Yeah, brilliant. This is the pin string we want to update. But hold the phone. This next step is the tricky bit. How do we change one digit of this string value without affecting the other digits? Well, there's a number of ways, but let me show you my favourite. We begin by splitting the letters up into yet another new list, naming it split for this sprite only. Start with it blank, deleting all of split. And then repeat, looping through all nine digits of pin string. We want to add each letter of pin string to the new list name split. And we know to get the digits out, we'll need to use a letter of and drop in the pin string. But which letter do we begin with? It should start with one, and then go on to two, three, four, etc. We could use a new variable, but think about this. The current length of the split list is zero, right? Because it's empty. So zero plus one gives us one, and that is the first letter of pen string. Now, once we've added this letter to the split list, we repeat around for a second letter. How many items are now in the split list? That's right, one, since we just added it. So length is now one, and one plus one is two. So we get the second letter added to split. And this repeats. Each time around, adding the next letter until all nine digits are added to our split list. Shall we see that in action? Click the test script again. And ta-da, we have all nine digits split out into our split list. Well, at least it looks like it, but it's hard to tell because these are all zeros anyway, so for now you'll just have to take my word for it. But why did I go to the bother of putting all these digits into a new list? Shall I show you a really funky scratch feature? Tell me in the comments if this was new to you. Drag out the list reporter itself into your project, 
and try clicking it to see its value. Well, this is showing as a single nine digit value again, even though we are looking at the value of our list. Now, usually lists report items separated by spaces, but under the special circumstance where every item in the list is one digit long, instead it returns the list as a single value without spaces. And this is mega useful for putting string values back together again. Right then, we get ahead of ourselves though. First, we must actually update the pin. Luckily, that's easy. Replace item of the split list, and the pin number we are changing is given by the input pin hash. The value we are setting to is given by the input value. Nice, that gives us a chance to test our scripts again. And now we should be able to confirm that it does actually replace item one in our split list with a one as requested. That's great news. And it means that if we now click the split list reporter again, and there you see, the first pin has changed to a one. Really useful indeed. All that's left then is to stuff the updated pin value back into our tile pin list to store away that important metadata. Replace item for item number tile hash, that's our tile costume, of the tile pins list, of course, with, and this is my favourite bit, the list reporter, split. Yes, you really can use lists like that. Watch what happens when we run our test script now. Tile pins item 20 is all zeros, but after running the script, now pin 1 of item 20 is set to 1. Let's try that setting pin 3 to 1 instead. Click. And look, now both pins 1 and 3 of item 20 are set. Want to reset pin 3 back to 0? It's easy. See? How about pin 3 of item 21 to a 1? That's a new item entirely. Click. Looking down in the list, and there it is. Just pin 3 of item 21. Isn't that an awesome little script that we've put together? So guys, what are we waiting for? If this is correct, then we should be able to run the project and actually see these pins being changed in the level editor, remembering to click P to see our pins. Yes, there they are. I should be able to inject new pins in real time by simply changing the set pin test script and clicking it. Ha <laughs> ha, that is fun. A new pin at pin five. But you know, if I just hide all these variable reporters, don't forget that before coding up the set pin script, we already coded up the key presses to allow us to change pins in the level editor. So in theory, with all the pins showing, we just need to hover over a pin and press the one key. Oh my gosh, would you look at that? Oh, oops. Um, hmm. What I didn't anticipate is that I already used the one key to toggle layers in the editor. Yeah, oops. I'll fix that in a moment. In the meantime, enjoy pressing X to remove a pin. Splendid. This is working brilliantly. Right. Let's address the key binding issue. The easiest solution is to prevent the changing of layers while the meta editor is enabled. So find the when one key pressed. Yeah, this uses the set layer block from down here, so we can disable this from there. Just surround this inner if else with a new if. And check if palette meta editor is less than one. And with the pin editor active, pressing one now doesn't switch layers any longer. Cool. Until I press the P again, and then switching layers is active once more. That's great, because that actually means, as the outro music begins, we are finally free to start laying down our official collision pins. And it's so easy, holding down one to draw a solid row of pins, and X to tidy up any mistakes. In our next RPG episode, we will actually add in the player to tile pin collision scripts. So if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, do it now so you can get alerted as soon as the video comes out. Yeah, check the notification bell and all. Also, if you haven't given this video a thumbs up, then please do smash that like button now as it makes all the difference to getting my videos seen by other fellow scratchers. Thank you so much. 
there's been a lot of interest in my Early Access membership of late, and that's no surprise as members get to see my videos early, not only getting the chance to get ahead of the game, but also having added perks like priority replies to comments and custom channel emoji. For those of you who are teachers or educators, please consider supporting my channel too, either through Patreon or by becoming an Inner Circle member of this channel. It's a small price to pay for the work I put in and you get the bonuses of access to my finished projects. And that is it from me today. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, have a great week ahead and scratch on guys.